-hmm. Okay, so welcome to lesson two, evolution of an idea. We're gonna look at the different theories that revolved around evolution as a whole, how they kind of piggybacked on each other and how they were used to develop the general idea of evolution by Charles Darwin. And we won't get into Darwin's specifics until a little bit later, but we'll look at the specific ideas of the different theories that arose as a result of change with regards to species, with regards to the planet itself, and all sorts of aspects that kind of tied together to allow for the concept of evolution to really be researched and discussed. And I wanna stress how important this, for this lesson is because as I release the assignment for your essay for this unit, you're gonna have to draw back connections to some of these theories and ideas. So having a really strong idea of them, and if you do have questions with regards to them, uh, it'll be good for you to ask after I finish teaching just because it will be something you will have to draw upon quite often for your essays and uh, it's kind of cool and kind of important. So when we look at the early ideas of the origin of living things, uh, it was it used to be thought that things were immutable and I love this word because it the idea of change happening or not happening was something that for a very, very long time, uh, people just thought everything was not going to change. It was the way that it was. It was the way that it has always been. Their understanding was based off of religious teachings, and that was always uh, founded in some type of text, which said that things were created a certain way, and that was the way they've always been. But there were several theories and ideas and people, specifically Aristotle, Linnaeus, and, and Erasmus Darwin, who doesn't really share any relation to Charles Darwin, but has the same last name, where they kind of started looking at things in terms of simple versus complex species. And they really were looking at the ideas of dividing organisms into groups and the idea that life came from some type of source and so it started kind of challenging the idea that things did in fact change and they weren't just immutable and and that kind of started the ball rolling as early as 384 bc in terms of the ideas that revolved around evolution so when we look at the 18th century specifically the evolutionary ideas of uh, georges louis leclerc de buffon from the 1700s to the 1780 or the late 1700s, we, he really looked at the idea that physical structures connected to their function. And, and what that means is when we think about how our hands, how our arms, how our legs function, the, the structure with which they possess, it is a direct result of the function with which that they possess. No one, or sorry, I should say very few people do their fine motor skills with their feet and very few people run marathons on their arms, our appendages specifically function for a specific task and, or specific tasks. And those physical structures developed to perform that function specifically. So these structures are in place or these, the, yeah, these structures are in place to, to fulfill a specific function and they do that thing very well. These organisms have seemingly useless features, and he found that there are a lot of them within species, humans are included, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And they used to be useful at some point in time, but they're no longer as useful anymore. Uh, we talk about the appendix, we talk about other aspects with regards to humanity having these uh, vestigial features, and I'll talk a little bit more about that afterwards. Um, but he, uh, Buffon was the first person that really suggested this idea. Uh, Lamarck, came up with the uh, idea that there was a mechanism for evolution. Uh, his theory had two main ideas, that if you use something, it will become stronger or larger, and that these traits get passed on from parents to offspring. One of these ideas is a little bit kind of wonky and not quite correct, but the, the second one specifically is, is a fantastic concept that he came up with, again, in the mid-1700s, um, mid to late 1700s, and the, the idea that things are inherited. So Lamarck's theory mainly revolved around giraffes and the idea that they have longer necks because they use them more and that this doesn't always pass on to offspring, but it is indeed something that is inherited. So it's not something that applies to all traits, but again, it's the idea that he had the idea that use and disuse, the stronger it became, the more it was used and then passing on to offspring was like the main concept of that. And he, he studied giraffes, ironically enough, in the 1700s. So this idea that Lamarck suggested thing is that 
things can change over time. Nothing is immutable or species itself are not immutable and they do change over a period of time. And it's based on their environment. These traits develop as a result of being around specific environmental factors that allow for things to develop. And then as a result of those things to develop, these traits are then passed on from parents to offspring. And it, it's interesting because it did, dis, it did lead to a lot of discussion with regards to current research uh, at the time, mind you, uh, with regards to furthering theories of evolution, even though it wasn't really called that at the time. So when we look at fossils and these patterns of change, a fossil is the idea that it's a, an impression or an actual pieces from the organism that have become mineralized uh, as a result of pressure in, in rocks or underneath rocks and dirt over thousands of years. This fossil formation is usually revolving around soft tissue, uh, so skin, muscles, etc., being decomposed and then leaving those hard tissues like bones to be fossilized. These sediments are usually in water and they cover that sample and then as a result of that accumulation, these mineralizations occur to, uh, due to the heat and pressure and they form those fossilized bones, if you will. So the idea that the fossil record is utilized in evolution is quite, uh, it's quite often referred to in that idea that there are many fossils of unknown organisms, uh, thought thousands of species that are no longer living, and that these fossils are very deep under the surface, either through dirt or underneath water and underneath the, the, the bottom of lakes and oceans. And these fossils are often found in unusual places. And the reason being is that the earth is very old and it looked very different tens of thousands, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of years ago. And that different look, so to speak, allowed for fossils to be found in really weird places. And I'll, I'll talk about that as we move through this lesson as, or this unit as well. Uh, Cuvier was a paleontologist in the, again, mid to late uh, 1800s who studied fossils in detail. And he noticed a couple of things, four main things that he noticed. Fossils are very simple organisms that are found in all depths of fossil deposits. Fossils of more complex organisms are found only at shallower depths or younger rock. So this is an interesting th idea because fossils at shallower depths resemble modern species today. And that idea that they were closely related at shallower or younger rock levels was an interesting idea because those rock layers contain fossils of many species that are not present in either layers above or in layers below. And it, and it suggests, again, that that change, that strong support for the theory that life changed and evolved from simple to complex organisms. So those simple fossils are found deeper and it, where the more complex ones are found closer to the surface. So Cuvier came up with the theory of catastrophism. So Cuvier believed that there was not the species themselves that were changing. Instead, he believed that these catastrophes were coming to fruition and that these catastrophes led to changes that allowed for species to evolve or change themselves. So uh, catastrophic events like natural disasters could ma causes mass extinction of organisms that are then replaced by new organisms. So it does not explain the increasing complexity as you move forward in time, but his main idea was that uh, we don't see dinosaurs today. And so therefore a catastrophe completely wiped them out and as a result of them completely being wiped out, new organisms could take their place. And at the time it was revolutionary, at the time it was incredibly supported. And there are aspects of his theory and ideas that still maintain in the, the common zeitgeist of, of the ideas that we adhere to with regards to evolution. But at the end of the day, the, the cool thing that he came up with is that, that there was large catastrophic events that led to mass extinction, extinctions of large organisms. Uh, and that allowed for certain aspects of evolution to take place. But he underestimated the idea that they weren't quite replaced so much as the surviving ones had to adapt and change. So Charles Lyell, uh, early 1800s to the late 1800s, kind of was the father of modern geology, uh, the study of the earth and structures of, of, of the earth as they change over time. And he came up with the theory of uniformitarianism. And it's that idea that these geological changes are so slow, they create fossils over a very long period of time. And that slow, long period of time allowed for him to create these three principal ideas of geology uh, in around the early 1800s. So he came up with the idea that this earth changing process uh, in the past is occurring in the present as well. 
So the plate tectonics, rock cycle, water cycle, all of those things are contributing to that process of geological change, even today. That geological change is very slow and very gradual, and it's, it's complete opposite of that fast catastrophic nature that was discussed by Cuvier above. And then lastly, his idea of that natural laws influence how strong these changes are. Um, they, yeah, it's basically the, op the idea that in the past, they were as intense as they are today, or they weren't as intense as they are today, but there's no in between, there's no variance. It's, it's gonna be the exact same. If, if a huge earthquake happens now, the magnitude of with which it can happen at from zero to 10 on the Richter scale, it, it's not gonna be any more or any less than it was hundreds of millions of years ago. So that intensity today versus the intensity before, it allows for some consistency with regards to his ideas in geology. So Liao's theory uh, that the earth is extremely old, which meant that life has been around for a long time and has undergone, undergone evolutionary change. The older the earth, that means the more time there is for change. And again, that concept of immutable comes up again that we discussed at the beginning of this lesson that things weren't always just the way that they, we see them and the way that they were. The old earth allowed idea allowed for the concept of change happening over a very long period of time. And so by the mid 1800s, there were a lot of scientists that had the idea that, well, if the earth was this old and it's changed so much in the, you know, the hundreds of millions and, and even billions of years, what does that mean in terms of the species with which live on our planet? And, and there was no real tangible mechanism to describe how they changed. It was really just focused on observations of those fossils, observations of how the earth has changed. And Lyell was friends with Charles Darwin and he kind of helped, I guess, spark the, the interest in Charles Darwin with regards to that change. And, and we as a biology or biologists are irrevocably changed as a result of that. So. Uh, we'll spend a bit more time tomorrow talking about Charles Darwin and uh, looking at some of the theories throughout the rest of this unit. So that's it for this lesson. If you have questions, you know where to find me.